webinar on COVID-19 testing. Everyone is already muted. If you have any questions at any point, you can submit them via the chat box. If you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, um, there will be some icons that pop up and one of them is a speech bubble that will bring up the chat box. If you submitted questions ahead of time when you registered, we have those already and we'll have plenty of time to address all the questions at the end of the presentation. We are also recording this session, so if you need to step out or if you have anyone else you want to share it with, it will be posted on the Marin Health YouTube channel uh, early next week. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Dr. Greg Tolliver, a Marin Health Infectious Disease Physician and our Medical Director of Infection Control. Dr. Tolliver, thank you so much for um, joining us to share your knowledge on this very hot topic. Um, go ahead and take it away. Sure, thanks, Monica. Hope you guys can hear me. And yeah, I'm Dr. Greg Tolliver. I'm the Medical Director of Infection Control and Practicing Clinical Infectious Disease Physician at Marine Health. So um, I was asked to provide a bit of a testing update and uh, I made a few slides uh, last night to share. So, and I got a few of your questions uh, um, to um, hopefully I'll answer. Um, so, um, I'll start by saying, well, let's let's ask why why are we testing? Um, and um, we've got our personal reasons mostly, right? We usually feel like we, um, you know you know, as Americans, okay, we, we want to find out about something we can go buy a, a diagnostic test perhaps in the store or or more likely call our doctor, yeah, engage the healthcare system. That's a that's the most common way. That's like that's a clinical, it's a clinical uh, thing. But it with COVID nineteen it it it's um it's not necessarily um, a clinical presentation sometimes, right? We know there's asymptomatic carriers. So, so then what? Uh, yeah, you know, then um, you just go and get tested, um, but you don't have any symptoms. Uh, you know, is that is that something that you got to do, or your work told you to do? So let's, we'll go through some of that stuff. Um, but you know, often we'll get tested because we're feeling ill, um, or um, or or maybe we had contact with somebody, uh, our family member um, who got diagnosed. Um, we want to not spread it to other people. We want to get therapy for it. it um, if we if we get ill, we want to quarantine ourselves. If um, if we've had a significant exposure, um, so I'll go through some of the reasons. Um, but there's also besides the clinical perspective on testing for SARS-CoV-2 virus, there's the um, there's the other aspect. It's the public health aspect, and so COVID-19 blurs those lines um, because it's a, it's a pandemic. And, and what do we do about the other kind of testing? So part of this talk, I'm going to talk about the routine issues that you guys might face, but also I want to kind of change the paradigm a bit um, and uh, on the way people think about it. Um, and this is kind of a paradigm shift um, that's been happening in the past month or so um, as uh, our our testing capacity in the United States basically is part of it is is it's breaking down in different places. We're still having trouble getting reagents. Uh, machines that have been running um, the tests have been breaking down in certain places. So we started out with in in February really without the testing that we needed, without the surveillance. So we didn't even know what was going on, and then we found out later that uh, the virus is already already circulating in early February. Uh, in Santa Clara County, for example, and and earlier uh, in, in Washington State, um, and we had no idea because we didn't have the tests. Um, so this is from the CDC. Um, this uh, uh, this slide from the CDC from basically Public Health 101. Um, and uh, I can make you click through those, but um, I get, this is from the next slide from the CDC and. If you just want to look at this, what are, what are we doing here with testing on the purpose of epidemiology? Well, we first got to identify the populations who are at risk. That's that's true. Assessing effectiveness of interventions. That's true. Does public health provide treatment and for patients in clinical settings? No, it's not designed for that. Um, and then determining importance causes of illness. So we didn't have the surveillance initially, 
And we're still trying to use a clinical test for surveillance and deal with a public health problem through a medical system. Um, so um, we didn't, we didn't um, initially, the CDC response was pretty delayed. Their testing had problems. Um, and so we couldn't even get to step one, which was, um, you know, evaluating the existence of an outbreak. Um, and we didn't have data to tell us what was going on and we couldn't respond um, as a nation um, back in appropriately back in February. So that's still an issue. We still don't have good surveillance uh, for, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Uh, so um, we were kind of blindsided by that attack, um, if you want to call it that, and a lot of people will call it um, uh, the, you know, the outbreak, the um, of COVID-19, the pandemic, and kind of a silent attack. Um, and I'm going to point you towards um, a couple of articles that are pretty interesting and a couple of sources, but do we really have a national testing strategy? Well, not really. Um, this is the, this is what they're they are saying um, as of a couple of days ago, since Mark Trump administration's approach COVID-19 response from locally executed, state man managed, and federally supported. So our response to Marin has been almost um, has been state driven and and locally executed, and I got to say that's the all the response in Marin and San Francisco has been really good uh, compared to a lot of other places um, because we had reasonably robust a public health program in Marin and certainly in San Francisco that's really pr helped protect the population. That's what it's designed for. So how do we how does testing fit into this graph? How do we explain this graph? Um, we are around 500 million uh, cases total. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we just have so many more cases and so many more deaths than any, than any other country. China still hasn't gone over 100,000 cases. Uh, why is that? Um, well, so a lot of it does have to do with testing. Um, but uh, there was an opportunity back in, in January and February to do federal testing, uh, federally, uh, not mandated, but um, like programmed and planned response and that would have been the standard public health response and and i believe that uh and from hearing people from people at the cdc that 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 um that plan was basically not supported by uh the trump administration um so and it, i just there's a couple of points where that they did stop doing their uh, covid uh sites in in june the, on the federal federal ones and we're also having still issues with surveillance the um, the data coming from hospitals was removed from the CDC in mid July. So um, finding out actually what where all the hotspots had become a little bit harder because of that um, those choices. Um, even recently, with the, at the end of July, the um, uh, the Assistant Secretary for Health um, and Human Services, um, Gilbert, I think that's what he said. He says we can't test our way. Out of the out of the pandemic, and I would say that that's um, really not how public health works. Is really we do um, want to do a whole lot of tests, and and that's why and get the results back quickly and isolate people. So that's our that's our uh, curve uh, of testing in the United States. So um, we've had a decrease recently, and the reason for that partially is some some degree of um, lack of um testing capacity and even in hotspots um decreasing um proportion of people um feeling the urgency to go get tested or being afraid to go to the hospital in certain hotspots and also i've heard because like some machines have because they've been used so much so we're still relying on a completely clinical platform to make um to do our surveillance and control the epidemic uh, and what I mean by clinical is that these tests that, you know, which I'm going to get to here, are um, basically um, PCR tests that are, are clinical grade. So that's what we mean when we say testing. Um, the gold standard is PCR. Uh, it's 99% uh, percent positive, I mean, percent sensitive. And um, it's even... You could consider it even too sensitive. I'm going to explain that in a little bit. So 
Um, that's the swab that we talk about. And you know, if you, what we're really what the swab tests for really is, did you have this infection re, um, recently, or are you are you still like making making virus? Uh, there are also antigen tests that are starting to come out. Um, they are cheaper and faster. Uh, turnaround time is quicker. They are not quite as sensitive, but some are uh, upwards of 85 to 90 percent. And those, recently, the WHO said they've got to be 97 percent sensitive. So, however, the FDA is the body, um, the governing body in the United States, who determines uh, the full if tests can be released or not. And at this point in time, they're still uh, planning to continue to approve tests that only meet clinical grade um, testing standards. So um, uh, well, let's all talk a little bit about that. The antibody tests, uh, which people have been excited about, and I was excited about, um, at this point in time, aren't very useful for people. Um, so um, the part of it is because the science of, of immunity is totally incomplete at this point. But um, the, uh, the, the proteins that do, um, and the amount of, of antibody that's necessary to provide effective immunity and how long that might last has not really been determined yet. So the antibody test, um, if you just hear about it, it's like, it, it's, it's um, which antibody is it against? I, I, I don't know. There's 200 or so tests out there too. So they're better right now for determining how many people in the population have had, been, have had the infection. And that's useful in, in, uh, in this scenario, COVID-19 and the pandemic, because there's so many asymptomatic um, people out there. So um, here's an overview from the FDA of the characteristics of um, those three different classes of tests. So you could get an antibody test. I believe you could get it from Amazon. Um, there are uh, Quest has an antibody test. And if you wanted to donate blood, if, um, for example, um, for, for treatment, um, convalescent serum, that would be a way you'd find out to use an antibody test. But right now, it's the molecular test is, is what we're really talking about. And um, it's um, incredibly sensitive. So we found out more about the viral kinetics uh, recently, and I'm gonna, my slides are a little out of order, but I want you to see this slide. And um, uh, basically we understand now that um, a day or two prior to onset of symptoms when you're making the most virus. Um, and um, so that's problematic for disease control. And that's one of the reasons why it's a pandemic virus is um, you're dumping virus and you don't even know it. Um, so waiting till someone's symptomatic is a problem, um, especially if they're never gonna become symptomatic and other 60% of people don't ever have symptoms. Um, what I, I wanna show you on the, on the left-hand side is the CT value. And that's basically tells you how much virus you have. Um, so uh, higher CT values mean lower amounts of virus. So typically people start out with CT viral by, um, values like 10 to 20. We, we um, when you do an RT-PCR test, um, you, you actually create a CT value, but they are not published with the result. The result is just positive or negative. So what's happening is that you're actually uh, capturing people uh, way after, many people get captured by the RT-PCR way after their symptoms and way after um, they are, um, they've stopped being infectious, but they are still detecting uh, little bits of RNA um, and it's not live virus. So that's, that's um, has complicated um, our testing strategy because at this point in time, um, I've got, you can see this on the slide too. Um, you're, um, you're call, we are calling people who are positive um, infectious um, and when actually they're probably not based on their cycle threshold values. And the CT value is the number of times that the machine has to um, uh, go and keep reproducing um, the amount of RNA that was in the initial sample. So um, number of cycles um, means the lower amount of, uh, of uh, virus that was collected initially. So, um, it's a soup that the PCR is so sensitive, so it can detect really tiny amounts of virus, like 10 viral particles and amplify it up. And I just had a patient yesterday who came to the hospital and I found out um, that I asked actually what their CT value was and it was 40. So that means they really had like 10 little viral bits on them. But 
we we were kind of stuck with treating them as if they're infectious, even though we really know that they, well, they weren't. Um, so you could say that the actual test, the PCR test that we have now, is not necessarily as sensitive as we would like it. Because what we really want to know is when are people infectious, right? Now, so um, if we knew that time period and we would kind of know more, we tested for that time period, uh, then we'd be able to isolate people uh, more rapidly. Uh, um, so this, this slide shows, uh, shows the correlation between how much virus um, particles are, are found and duration of symptoms. And what I want to clarify is, is on the PCR test, um, uh, there's a long tail as I showed you um, in this one where it goes out days past, it kind of slopes out slowly. After day 10, um, you're just detecting little viral bits that are not alive. You know, people are not really transmitting virus after 10 days after the first positive test unless they're really immunocompromised. So you can see the black dots are when they grew culture, somebody, um, and that's the gold standard for infectivity business, is uh, um, the people who are infectious really were producing um, on a large scale, 100,000 or more like um, half a million to a million viral particles or more, um, or 10 million. 100 million viral particles, those people uh, were at that amount of RNA were um, uh, in, considered infectious uh, at that point in time. Um, and so, so I want to credit um, somebody who's been working at my alma mater, um, Harvard School of Public Health, um, this uh, physician, uh, Michael Minna, I got some ideas from. And he's really kind of changed some of the thinking about testing in the United States in the past month. So. Right now, we have the super sensitive test that when you think clinically and you're the physician seeing that patient is that's what you want. You don't want to miss people with a deadly disease. You want to capture every single person. We've got it. And that's what the PCR does for us. Unfortunately, it's slow and expensive. And, and at this point in time, it's also detecting all these people who are not infectious. And so by the time the results come back to them, um, you've completely missed the opportunity to um, quarantine and isolate. Um, that per, that uh, patient. So what he's proposing is that we um, you test more frequently and more often. Um, and even if you have a lower sensitivity, that's okay. So I'm going to go back to this other slide that show um, that he um, has presented from his model. And I don't know if you see the um, he is the um, that's the amount of virus. Um, so this shows it on the left. If you tested daily, the sensitivity. Um, that's the percents uh, or the reduction in the, in the R naught. So that's how quickly do you reduce um, P, um, uh, spread in the community? So if you do it daily, um, and the, your limit of detection is um, 10 to the third, 10 to the fifth, the 10 to the limit of the third, that's the PCR, and the, and the bottom one, 10 to the fifth, that's the, like the antigen test or maybe the added ID now. Um, uh, which is a nucleic acid test. Even if you're doing a three um, test every three days, you're still detecting, uh, or you're still reducing spread uh, really quickly. Um, especially if you get the result right away on the first day. So um, you're getting 90% of people um, with the test. It's not quite as sensitive, uh, and it's basically depends on how quickly you're, you're testing people. If you're if you look at weekly or 14 days, you're not capturing enough people by either mode. Um, to really impact um, um, the uh, R naught, which is um, how rapidly the disease is spreading in that community. Um, so um, I'm going to get into uh, a couple other points here. But the point here is what what, what I'm talking about and what Dr. Minow has been talking about. They've also had it on the UCSF uh, grand rounds. Um, and most public health experts in infectious diseases are saying is that we need a lot more tests that maybe aren't quite as accurate, but are done more frequently. And the technology is there. We've had this technology for a while. It's the same technology that you can use to get a pregnancy test at home. It's a lateral flow assay. Um, and these can be printed on pieces of paper for a dollar. So um, there's a New York Times article about that. I like this slide. This is pretty new and it shows exactly what I was talking about where um, in the the picture on the on the right, um, it, the majority of um, the 
tests that were done in the past eight weeks in Massachusetts, the gray area, that's um, they're capturing all those on people with uh, at the point where their CT value is is um, high and their amount of virus is low, and that's the vast majority of the test results in Massachusetts, which is testing well and has a good testing program. So it what you having these people with positive tests and they're not infectious, but they're still spending tens of, I mean, tons of energy trying to um, isolate and quarantine them, taking them out of work, and they're not even infectious. Um, this is this is all kind of coming into clarity as we understand more about the virus. Um, so um, the the basic strategy at this point in time is we're trying to uh, people in Infectious Disease Society of America and at Harvard School of Public Health and uh, many universities are are basically trying to get their congressmen to change the paradigm. So um, instead of having um, tests go through Quest and they can't do it and, and LabCorp and be ordered by your doctor, it's just not frequently enough, it's um, that we, we need a, a national plan where there's access for everybody in the community to cheap um, tests that could be done either with a quick self-nasal swab or um, spit on a piece of paper. And if we had that, um, which is totally possible, we could be back at school right now and, and the amount of transmission we'd have in the United States would be compared to comparable to other other countries um it would be incredibly low and um and then also we would be able to open up our economy all at the same time so um at this point in time our testing strategy is detecting about three three percent of people um who are infectious and we get to them we get the results back and we isolate them in time um, so we're missing 97 percent of people um at this point with our testing strategy um so I've got uh, I, I've got some of the questions here, but um, I think I'd like to open up um, the rest of the time. I've been talking for 20 minutes here um, for other questions, but I can address these um, first. So if you don't have insurance, you're definitely going to get treated and, and you can't get tested. And you can there's an expanded um, Cover California option, and then the link is up here. The, the turnaround time is technically the time the lab gets it, the time it turns around the result and sends it out electronically. So uh, anything beyond 48 hours, even uh, maybe 72 hours is mostly useless um, and um, ends up basically spinning wheels and wasting resources. So turnout time is really important. In your mind, as a as someone, consumer of a test, it's like, well, you do the test now quickly, you get the result. So sometimes it's resulted, but it doesn't get to the people who need to take the action um, for another day or two because of a lot of times staffing issues because most public health um, programs that are county based and seek like just don't have the manpower to do this don't have kind of um, callback and isolation questions and so forth. So um, it's a risk of, of infectious testing. Well, it depends on where you do it. Um, in Marin, um, we've had really safe setups for for testing. So no, um, but if you're, you know, in a in an indoors space with a bunch of people, that's always a risk. Um, if you're outdoors, it's, it's less so. But yeah, you know, it, it has to do with uh, with social distancing. Um, it, at this point in time, it doesn't look like people who are asymptomatic have lower viral loads. In fact, the recent study of people who are asymptomatic had slightly higher viral loads in in, some, in their lung fluid on a recent. So it's it, it, it's it's variable. Um, in terms of healthcare workers who've been exposed and haven't gotten sick uh, are the contributing to herd immunity. Um, it, it, it's unclear um, uh, how many healthcare workers uh, we've had that have been exposed and are already semi-immune. We, because we haven't done as much, um, and this includes like the Kaiser, they haven't been full on uh, many of their healthcare workers as, as they would like because the testing, uh, the tests are still really limited and we've had limitations at, at Vernon Health, just like every other hospital, even though we've been in much better shape. Um, same thing for UCSF, they're just now starting to um, do a volunteer asymptomatic um, testing program with PCRs for their healthcare workers and we're, hope, we're hoping we can do that at Vernon Health in the hospital. The clinics are, um, are the Marin Health um, network clinics are starting to do that. Um, Right now, this week. Um, uh, so this gets to my point where um, masks are so important, and we've got recent data that not only we, um, do they um, help you protect the people around you, and that's the original reason why we want to do cloth masks, surgical masks, 
um, because it stops drop spread, uh, the primary um, process of uh, COVID-19 being spread. But um, there's recent data that, that the amount of virus um, can be decreased by wearing a face mask as well. Um, so um, in that if you get a small amount of virus, and you might be symptomatic, um, and you might have less severe disease. That's some good of science. Um, yeah. The um, so I guess it depends on what this question about effectiveness. Well, what are we what are we looking for? And I think that's just the, back to the original question: is like what what do you what do people care about? What is the difference from what I might care about? Um, because I want to make sure that you don't spread to other people, but you want to know you know are you going to get sick? So. Um, there are so there's there's there was over 200 antibody tests approved and I don't think they have that much utility at this point. And then there's a few antigen tests that have been approved, and it kind of just depends on what why are you getting the test and um, and there's there's guidelines for that. Um, the California California State has a testing um, um, committee uh, and I'm going to put that up here um, and. Uh, it depends on what you're looking for, but at this point, if you could go and get an antigen test or an Abbott ID now, the um, time period where that test is going to be positive matches up pretty well with the time period of infectiousness, and that's really kind of what we most care about. So, um, so if you can get that rapid test and um, and the result back quickly, that's that's the most effective way both to isolate um, uh, yourself, uh, quarantine people you've had close contact with, and, and and um, and then if you get worse, um, you could um, you can seek care and and tell tell people before you get there. Um, right now, um, uh, there was a strategy to use tests to determine whether or not people um, needed to be taken off isolation. And the, on July 17th, the CDC kind of got rid of that because people were testing positive, and it, it's the tail phenomenon I talked about. Uh, and they weren't really infectious. So at this point. It's 10 days, uh, and um, you got to be really immunocompromised, um, and then maybe it's 20. And when they've done studies all around the world, um, they're looking for live virus coming from people after their first PCR. They, they can't find hardly any people that are shedding much virus beyond, let's say, 15 days. So 20 days is a real um, is a real stretch. So um, that's a challenge, though, uh, because it's a scary disease. So um, there's a lot of education we've been doing in the hospital um, as we we're trying to take people who are known positive and taking them off isolation or people who are known positive and are coming back to the emergency room. What do we do? So we do almost dealing with those on a case by case basis at this point in time. Um, so, I mean, if it's gonna take you 10 days to get your result back, I don't see the point um, unless you're gonna get really sick. Um, so there is some places where they've kind of slowed down on the volume, but I'm gonna get to um, the, testing um, priorities, California testing guidelines. And so if you're hospitalized um, or if you're part, if you're being investigated for an outbreak, that's, that's the, that's the number one priority for testing. And, and this is something that you should think about if you're going to go get, thinking about getting tested is like, where's your, your priority? Because chances are you're taking in some way, you're taking reagents um, from somebody else who, who might need to be tested more. So anybody who has symptoms is going to get tested or is in tier two. And should close contact of confirmed cases. They were tier one, but now they're tier two. Um, and people who work in a, in a congregate care facility. Um, and you could you can catch these online. If you just if you just Google California testing um, uh, priorities and guidelines. Um, it goes on for a while, but um, people who are tier three are um, healthcare workers are tier two. Uh, and tier three is more like food services, agricultural, retail people. Um, they haven't even activated the tier four yet. So um, credits for Michael Minna. Um, and these are a couple of resources I'm going to leave up here that you might want to check. The UCSF COVID-19 grand rounds are good for um, medically oriented people. Um, but I think podcasts and listening to um, podcasts um, is um, entertaining and a good way to get a bunch of info in. Um, so the This Week in Virology, the 640, um, is the one where I, I heard it right after it came out. Um, I got to say, I wasn't listening to all of those, but when I heard that podcast, I was like, oh, wow, that, that's it. I think that's it. So um, that is really a paradigm changer. So um, other resources um, that are really good are um, Osterholm Update, um, the Harvard Chan, This Week in Health podcast. Um, but there's all these 
um, MOOCs, I think we call them the massive online open courses. So a really good one is uh, the MedCram ones that explain these concepts and Vumedi uh, physicians are, are um, using the videos there to share information a lot. So um, there's a, the Vanity Fair article is pretty interesting and shows like what, what was planned for a national plan of what actually happened. And so, um, so I think that's all my slides um, and I'm happy to take some questions. Okay, we are just about time, but um, Dr. Tolliver, thank you. It sounds like you're able to stay on for a couple more minutes. So if anyone else has questions, please do submit them now in the chat box. We've had a couple come in. Um, for starters, um, if someone, a patient comes in with symptoms while we are waiting for the test results back, do are they recommended to isolate and what are the precautions that they can take while awaiting results? Yeah, so it, some of it depends on um, where you're going to get tested. So if you got uh, tested in say, the emergency room, um, then you might not get the result back for 48 hours. But um, the the um, Marine Health and Human Services website, coronavirus, if you Google that, it's got all the uh, all the guidelines for isolation and quarantine. So isolation is what you do if you're positive um, or highly suspect, um, uh, your person under investigation, and then quarantine is for those close contacts here. So um, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna stay home and you're gonna wait and you're gonna avoid contact with people and you're gonna put a mask on, um, and you're not gonna go out. So uh, that's that's what you would it, um, it, until you got your test result back. This is gonna get more confusing in the winter um, because it, as flu mixes in with similar symptoms, um, but we're hoping to have combination testing for people where they come with viral symptoms that they're gonna get a COVID nineteen test and or SARS CoV two test if that's the virus, and and an influenza test. But um, you can easily find what you need to do, um, and you would get a call if you were positive, and they would tell you what to do as well. The case tracers. Okay, great. And then we just have one other question that's come in, um, asking about how long antibodies would stay present in your system. So this person saying their family was all sick back in March, like symptoms. Should they bother getting an antibody test at this point? Yeah. That's a good one. Um, the one, and it's like that. I'm really glad someone asked that, and and um, that's kind of like the thing that we we were really hoping for when I went out. Like, okay, get the antibody test. You know, you're immune, right? That's just it's just not going to happen right now. Um, so it's really not that useful. Um, and and the science is pretty unclear. But right now, the CDC says, okay, you if you tested positive by PCR, um, then you don't need to be tested again by PCR for 90 days. So at least 90 days. Um, so this has been going on for six months and in probably a couple more months, we're gonna find out like, can people really get reinfected? Um, but right now we haven't found anybody worldwide who's like definitively been reinfected. So unfortunately this coronavirus is like other coronaviruses and, and it's, it's very likely that the immunity is not gonna be a very robust and prolonged. And so I think we're looking at something like six months to a year as the antibody levels slowly decline. And we're still kind of trying to find how much uh, of the antibody do you need? And it'll be versus the spike protein um, to um, provide a new, what we call a neutralizing antibody such that you, you do have immunity. But I wanna also note that Immunity is just not the, it's not only the antibody. Um, it's, it's um, the really under start T cell mediated component um, of the immune system is, is pretty important. And a lot of times the T cell memory is, um, is something that remains intact longer than the antibody. So we, it looks like right now that maybe upwards of 40% of people uh, have um, decent T cell memory of uh, a coronavirus infection and that can translate over to um, asymptomatic disease perhaps in, in something like COVID-19 uh, from their T cells. So it might be years for T cells and months for, for antibodies and B cells um, in terms of how long you have immunity, but the science is incomplete at this point in time. So we'll, hopefully by the end of the year, that'll be more clear I have time for another question or two if there if there's if there is.
and uh, if there isn't if you haven't gone to the Marin um, DHHS coronavirus updates page and seen um, our, um, our public health officer um, um, Matt Willis um, uh, give give updates um, I would strongly recommend you do that and go to our website there's tons of data you can see exactly what's going on in our county and and I, I just got to say that every every day every week the processes that we have in place in, in Marin get better and better in terms of um, controlling controlling um, the pandemic and uh, allowing people to to kind of get closer to normal normalcy so but right now the, the big the big roadblock is the testing um, and we we're in no better shape than we were six months ago unfortunately so hopefully we're going to get those one dollar test months I'm hopeful that California alone will um, will get going on that and and actually you know put a huge contract um, together and and um, have cheap rapid testing for for the population um, you know talking two or three times a week for people who are healthcare workers and, and maybe even students that's that's my big hope um, we, because we could really shut it down um, the pandemic if, if we had that right now um, in terms of with the vaccines it's, it's going to be months um, before um, they're fully rolled out and, and there's some kind of herd immunity I wouldn't say that we're going to have herd immunity until the earliest at the end of 2021 we'll see So Dr. Tolliver, if you have time, we have one more question. Um, with the new removal of isolation standards, 10 days, is there a window of subjective error with this? Is it a concern that a patient would be removed from isolation too soon? And sorry, last one, is there an N95 recommended for these patients? Right, yeah, so that's a that's a good question. So, so, um, there is a little bit of potential room for error, but not really. So in the hospital, we've been taking things slowly and usually taking people off at day 12. Um, but when you looked at the science and looked at um, some of the bigger studies, um, then um, just that they can't find anybody after 10 days who have enough virus to infect people. So an N95 would not be recommended. And but basically, no one's really taking people off of isolation unless you're feeling pretty confident that um, they're through it. And usually you can see they haven't had a, a fever for like 10 days or longer. I mean, you, and if you look at, if if you go back to the data I was talking about, you got your positive PCR. Well, a lot of those positive PCRs are, are on people who are well past their infectious period. So you start there and then go 10 more days. So there's already a lot of built in um, inadvertently built in um, safety there. So um, because you, unless you know the cycle threshold for the first test, um, then um, uh, 10 days still is going to be enough. Um, if you know the cycle threshold, I'm hoping that the science will get strong enough so that you can get though um, right now the FDA prohibits release of cycle thresholds. So um, if the science is, is good enough and they'll hopefully start using those and we can get people off sooner because um, all these people are being isolated um, and um, they're, they're, they're at the hospital, at least they're consuming uh, their, their hospitalization concerns, um, you know, personal protective equipment, um, other tests. I mean, we try to stop the other tests, but it's a lot of resources to care of somebody who's quote COVID-19 positive. And that's one reason why we've been trying to really safely take people off of precautions. And that's a new thing. So we've been doing it slowly and carefully with a lot of education to do. Uh, but really, we're not taking anybody off if we think there's any chance that they're infectious. We're erring on the side of caution. Any other ones? We have one more if you if you have time for it. Um, someone who thinks they were in thinks they may have been exposed, um, but not showing any symptoms. Um, sounds like you're not recommending testing. So how long would you recommend that that person would quarantine? Yeah. So first thing to do in those situations is look at the definition of true exposure. Um, like, so were you like within six feet of somebody with no and and at least 
you didn't have or the other person didn't have a mask. Um, so, so just walking by somebody in the hallway, that's not an exposure. Um, even sitting um, in a conference room and everyone's masked, that's not an exposure. So you wanna be sure that it meets that definition. So the, the lot, almost all the transmission or a lot of the transmission is going on is in the household. Um, I suppose um, uh, in other states, um, like it, there's a, probably a lot going on, like it's a, a bar. A bar is like, a, let's have a super spreader event uh, um, at this point. And, and really we shouldn't, if we wanted to get back to school, we would have closed all the bars and have them open because people are talking loud, you don't have masks on. So um, if you didn't have what you what meets the true definition of an exposure and maybe and, and you, you're not really at risk for se severe disease you're not old maybe you don't need to get tested um at that point so um i would look at the guidelines at that at that point but um you want to that's the first thing we do when we're trying to figure out if someone really had an exposure is like get all the details um, um and then we'll like we guide our, our healthcare workers whether or not they really need to be tested And the other option is like, you know, if if you thought for sure it was an exposure, you can just quarantine and see if you develop symptoms. That's that's the other thing to do. And 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 you have the option of getting tested. So if you develop symptoms, you might want to seek care. Okay, we had one last question pop up. I'm sorry, we're sure. Keep pulling your time. I'm, I'm, um, I'm glad. It's not, I'm, I'm glad. I'm happy to answer. All right. Stop it at this one. Is there political resistance against the one dollar test? That's a really good question. So, I think that the that there is a huge consensus in the public health community, um, people who have masters in public health, that public public health has been really neglected in this country, and our our whole model is basically clinical care. And, not so much public health, and that's that's industries in the United States. So, um, so I think that there is um, maybe not so much. I think initially there was some maybe some resistance to the cheap test, but honestly, it looks like from my it looks like that people really just didn't consider the cheap tests the way they should have. So, I think it was more subconscious. And like, okay, let's just use Quest in this corporation for our testing. But that belies a fundamental lack of, of understanding of public health and, and also medical care in the medical system. Um, because you need a clinical test for some, and we really need surveillance. So I think um, that we're not going to see a change in the FDA's, be, um, the way it, 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 it goes about things. Um, Anytime soon, unfortunately, I wish it, um, they would make a change. I think maybe you know or don't have kind of lost the opportunity, but um, I think it's possible that that um, that like say California could do it. Um, like if they, I mean, actually I know that they're thinking about it. So um, I would be optimistic that it's that it's possible. Uh, uh, when a bunch of states get together, I really wish it, it was done in February at a national level, and they looked at all kinds of different testing options, and not, not basically just say, hey, to the corporations, hey, just give us what you can come up with, um, but and actually have kind of more of a, um, a military style um, response where you just mobilize the best and the brightest, like like we did for like the Manhattan Project, um, for this problem. Um, so I think there was some like either subconscious resistance to to doing things the normal way. I mean, in the normal way, that was like a, a normal public health response. I don't think that was uh, really done. Um, and and we know that the, um, that the Trump administration had basically disbanded our, um, our program we had for preparedness for a pandemic um, back in, in 2017. So, um, I think the pandemic is something that infectious disease people and public health people knew was coming. Um, and they've been saying this, but it's the kind of thing that's really hard to plan for. And, and if you're not trained in this kind of stuff, it's also hard to imagine unless you're like watching a lot of Netflix. Um, but that's why it's there. I mean, we, 
it's, it's gonna and it's gonna happen again. So that's my concern. Get something else, and and we're not prepared for that too. We really need surveillance on a county and state level, um, and um, and the ability to do the PCR tests um, uh, for anything that shows up um, and make those tests really quickly. So there's a lot to do in the United States to get ourselves better prepared uh, for for a future pandemic, such as uh, such as influenza. And that's that's one that like really scares me. But we've got the technology. It really is a political will thing. So let's be hopeful. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tolliver, for taking the time today, um, and especially for going over and your willingness to answer all of these questions. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, for for those of you who are interested in passing this along to your friends, family, and others, it will be posted on the Marin Health YouTube channel uh, probably Monday or Tuesday next week, and we'll share it on our social media channels as well. Take care, everyone. Have a stay safe and have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you, Marco.